Welcome to another episode of Biscuits and Jam from Southern Living. I'm Sid Evans, Editor-in-Chief of Southern Living Magazine. We've recorded these episodes as we've all sheltered at home, and between passionate conversations about Southern food, you'll also hear honest takes about how these cultural icons have been dealing with the pandemic. Over the last 45 years, my guest today has bridged the gap between blues, folk, and country. And though born and raised in Indiana, he found his musical calling in Nashville at just 18 years old. It was 300 miles south of Indianapolis, but my impression was it might as well have been Mars. People spoke different, they dressed different, they laughed different. There was some openness about it that I hadn't experienced. Since his debut album in 1974, John Hyatt has received nine Grammy nominations and a Lifetime Achievement Award for songwriting from the Americana Music Association. His most recent release, 2018's The Eclipse Sessions, marks the 25th album of his long and acclaimed career. On today's show, you'll hear his thoughts on having his work covered by legends like Bob Dylan, Emmy Lou Harris, and Buddy Guy. They almost always feel at least, gee, you like that song? <laughs> you know, you liked it enough to record it? You know, what, a, what an honor. Plus his first ever experience with barbecue, what it's like to make music with his daughter Lily, and more on episode nine of Biscuits and Jam. So John Hyatt, welcome to Biscuits and Jam. Uh, nice to be here. Where are my biscuits and jam? <laughs> They're in the mail. I, I sort of, I, it's hard to smell them through Google Chrome. <laughs> yeah, you, you get them when you finish the interview. We'll, we'll send them to you. Okay, good. All right. So tell me what it was like growing up in, uh, in Indiana. Growing up in Indiana, well, it was, it, was, uh, it was good. I'm a Midwesterner by nature, a Southerner by a preferred uh, living. <laughs> so, you know, I was seven kids in my family, and uh, I was born, what, 52. So, uh, you know, growing up in the 50s, you know, Dwight Eisenhower and Nikita Khrushchev later on banging with his shoe and the missile crisis. I remember my brothers and my father sitting around sweating that Cuban missile crisis. I thought it was the end of the world. <laughs> so who who was the uh, who was the cook in your family? My mother cooked, but she <laughs> she was not uh, she was okay. I mean, she cooked mass quantities of food for seven uh, nine people. I'm sorry with with mom and dad. So it was a lot of uh, cooking by a lot of. Campbell's cream of mushroom soup used in various uh, recipes. I remember distinctly the flavor of uh, Campbell's cream of mushroom soup. It kind of permeated her her entire uh, adventures in cuisine. She made good chili, though. Cream of mushroom soup can go a long way. It actually can. You know, it, it's not bad over a tuna loaf uh, casserole on Friday night. So, big family. What what did your holidays look like? How did you guys celebrate the holidays? Um, you know, big tree and um, midnight mass. So we were a Catholic family, so I uh, went to midnight mass. I was in the boys' choir, so one of my earliest musical delights was uh, singing the midnight mass up in the choir loft with the, you know, no light coming through the the uh, stained glass windows. It looked all even that much more mysterious. The various saints depicted, and and uh, I just remember being so moved by the Latin mass, Kyrie they song. Ecum Spiri Tutuo and all this mysterious jabber that I had no idea what it was about, but I just loved it. I remember weeping on the, on the singing Midnight Mass more than once, <laughs> I think. Yeah, I always loved the Midnight Mass in, in Memphis. We did that too. Ah, yeah, there you go. I bet it was uh, beautiful. Did you have a big Christmas Day kind of brunch thing, or what did y'all do? I think it was dinner later, and, uh, you know, my mother, uh, she came from that era where y you had to cook fowl to death. And so the turkey was, <laughs> there was no even considering whether it would be dry or not. It was, of course, it was dry. <laughs> it's turkey. <laughs> <laughs> so you kind of toughed it out. I always asked for the dark meat. That was your best shot. Getting something with moisture content in it. <laughs> <laughs> I heard somewhere that you were uh, an early Elvis fan. Yeah, I, ca I caught on to Elvis. Uh, the first cut I heard was Blue Moon of Kentucky. 
And I just thought, man, what is this? You know, being from the Midwest, of course, I didn't know at the time what it meant that he had, in fact, covered a bluegrass guy, Bill Monroe, one of his greatest songs, you know. And what a what a mixture that was. What, what were some of those early songs or artists that, that started to really wake you up to music and, and really have some meaning to you? Well, it was mostly, you know, I was just a Midwest kid. It was mostly records my brothers brought home. Uh, and Elvis Presley was the early, early influence. And then it was uh, the dance music of the early, late 50s, early 60s, Gary U.S. Bonds and uh, Joey D. and the Starlighters. And I just thought, these, I just thought it was such fabulous uh, music, uh, you know, the, that sort of I'd thing with the beat and a great vocalist and uh, uh, that sort of raggedy beat that, uh, that you could hear back in those days. I love that stuff. And could you crank that stuff up in the house, or did you kind of have to go somewhere else? <laughs> I, I started uh, sort of mimicking Elvis Presley. with a, my, One of my brothers had a tennis racket, didn't really play, and I pulled it out of the closet when I remember distinctly I was about nine. And I, uh, st- I stood in front of the mirror and pretended I was singing Blue Moon of Kentucky. So uh, that, was, that was sort of my emulation. And then when I was 11, I begged my mother to... Uh, let me take guitar lessons. And uh, that's when I picked up a guitar. I had a teacher for about two months. And I took about a dozen lessons. And, you know, he was pl- I was having to play the notes. You know, this is a B, this is a C. And I just, it just, I was bored to tears and didn't want to know anything about it. So I quit. And then um, we had to hand in the guitar. It was, a re- you know, you get the guitar with the lessons. So I had to hand the guitar back in. And I stayed on it for the next couple of weeks. And, uh, she bought me a, a red Stella, which was kind of like silver tone or K. I think she paid 28 bucks for it. It was a lot of money in those days. And so you, so you wrote a song at the age of 11. Is that right? Yeah. What I did after I handed in the rental guitar and my mom bought me that Stella, I, got, I went in and bought it. I got a Mel Bay chord book at the same time. I learned three chords. And I wrote my first song. It was about a girl. This was tail end of fifth grade going into sixth grade and so i in my sort of walter mitty way imagined that she was my girlfriend <laughs> which was couldn't be further from the truth but i uh, wrote a little song about her beth ann was her name yeah beth ann who you're a woman <laughs> near as i could tell So you moved to Nashville pretty young, right? Yeah, I was 18. I never finished high school. I, as soon as I was 16, I stopped going, and I think I'd go just enough to not get officially kicked out. And then uh, my mother said, well, you got, you got to either work or move out of this house. So I got various odd jobs, a short order cook I was for a while, a, a, roof, a roofing job that was very short-lived because I was afraid of heights. So... That was the end of that. But um, starting at 15, I had made various attempts to leave Indiana, and I wanted to uh, go out and be whatever I thought I was going to be as a songwriter and singer and all that stuff, musician. And um, so I made two or three trips uh, with friends, and I came. We came through Nashville, and I just was fell in love with the place. Met a guy named Bob Frank, who was a, a folk singer from Memphis. My hometown. Yeah, there you go. Made some records uh, uh, for uh, the Venerable Vanguard folk label. And uh, so anyway, I met him and uh, heard him play. And uh, we sat, we spent some time together. And I, I just thought he was a wonderful guy, a great songwriter. And uh, I said, so how do you survive? And he said, you know, I got a little deal with a publishing company. And they pay me money each week in advance against, you know, future earnings that my songs might earn. I said, really? <laughs> how much, you know, getting paid to be a songwriter? What is that? I said, how much do you get? If you don't mind my asking. He said, I get, they pay me 25 bucks a week. And I thought, I could live on that. So I went back home and I was determined to uh, get enough money together to come back to Nashville. So I worked a sort of a normal job for making 50 bucks a week, I think. 
uh, and bought a little um, Corvair from a, a friend of mine. I actually only paid him 35 bucks for it. They didn't have any floorboards. They were gone, rusted through. And uh, I said, man, I'm going to Nashville. I'm quitting this job. I'm going to Nashville. I'm gonna, I want to be a, a songwriter. I want to do what this other guy, Bob Frank, does. So I made this tape, uh, which I thought was exotic and would instantly get me, you know, not only a publishing deal, but a record contract and every other damn thing. And so I came down with uh, high hopes, and uh, it was 1970. And we spent the first night in Centennial Park. Me and oh, really? Wife sleeping under, <laughs> yeah, sleeping under a picnic table. And no cops bothered, nobody cared, you know. It was very quiet. You know, I mean, Nashville in those days was about maybe 400,000 people, you know, a, a sort of a bigger, small town, I guess, kind of. Were you at this point thinking about country music a lot? Was it, Were you drawn to country? No, you know, I didn't, I didn't know anything about country music. Uh, I mean, very little. I knew Hank Williams, and I'd put it together that Blue Moon of Kentucky was a Bill Monroe song. So I'd heard some bluegrass. And, uh, and I'd heard Hank Williams and Jimmy Rogers, but that was about it. I was more struck with the rhythm and blues stuff, you know, Otis Redding and the, the Memphis Stacks Volt stuff. And, uh, you know, I was more, more into that. You know, I discovered Bob Dylan, of course, when I was 15, 16. And Bob Dylan, who ended up covering one of your songs. That was freaky. What an honor. <laughs> what a thrill. It was funny because I sent him, he asked for songs in a conversation for this movie. I said, yeah, okay, you know, nervous, shaking in my boots. And then I wrote him, I wrote about three or four and sent them up to him and he, he turned them down. They were basically just bad Bob Dylan songs <laughs> is what they were. <laughs> so he did this, this song called The Usual, which is sort of my angry young man, period. Was there someone who really kind of, helped you take the next step, help you kind of get, get on your feet? A lot of people, you know, encourage, a little encouragement goes a long way. And uh, when you're a kid and trying to be a, some kind of artist, you're just dying for it. You're dying for somebody to say, you know, you, I think you, I think you got something there, you know, just a little encouragement. And so uh, Bobby Braddock springs to mind. I mean, he, you know, I was writing songs about killing ants with my guitar and, uh, you know, uh, whist whistles in my ears and all these weird sort of personal, wacky sort of kid stuff, really. But he was just full. And here's the guy that wrote, the, you know, all these great songs. And he was very encouraging and funny. So he was kind of an early, you know, hang in there kind of thing. Stay tuned for more with John Hyatt after the break. Welcome back to Biscuits and Jam from Southern Living. I'm Sid Evans, and we're talking with John Hyatt. So, John, you had a really big hit called Memphis in the Meantime. You had another huge hit called Drive South. You talked about the train to Birmingham. Uh, I mean, clearly, it, it seems the South is a place that speaks to you. Is that fair? Well, you know, I came to Nashville in those days. It was 300 miles south of Indianapolis, but my impression was it might as well have been Mars. It was so much different. I mean, the worlds were just, people spoke different, they dressed different, uh, they laughed different. There was some openness about it that I hadn't experienced, you know. I just loved it. I mean, I, you know, the first sort of thin-lipped Presbyterian woman I heard with the, that accent, that that middle Tennessee accent, I just just sent me to the moon. It was music, and and by that point, I'd kind of started to put together that most of the roots of the things that I'd grown up listening to had come from the southern United States, primarily from uh, most of the blues I listened to, uh, Mississippi John Hurt and Fred McDowell, and you know even the guys with the band Howlin' Wolf and uh, Muddy and all those guys. Uh, just that that was the sound that, that caught my ear. 
So what about the food? I mean, when you, you so you moved to Nashville and, and, you know, it's a completely different thing. I mean, are you discovering Southern food uh, for the first time? Oh, yeah. You know, we had cafeterias up north, but uh, I, I had an experience of meat and three. There was a place called Max. It's where a lot of us hung out because it was the cheapest meat and three in town. It was, I think it was 95 cents uh, in 1970 for, uh, you know, fried chicken and fried okra and most of it fried. But really, I'd never eaten anything like it. I mean, this I came from tuna noodle casserole, you know, <laughs> my mother, God bless her. So, yeah, it was a revelation in that area, too. Do you have any favorite dishes? Well, I mean, fried chicken is pretty hard to beat, you know, if you do it right. And uh, I fell I fell in love with grits, for God's sake. I never had a grit in my life. Uh, pinto beans with gravy, you know, things like that. It just, whew, man. Did you become a, a barbecue fan, or are you a barbecue fan? Yeah. had my first pig meat uh, in Nashville. We used to, I had a buddy, I met a guy who was uh, in college at Vanderbilt. And he'd haul us out to this little joint out in Wilson County. It was a uh, juke joint, a uh, dirt floor, and it was farmers, African-American farmers. It was called Rufus Carter's Place, and that was the guy's name, Rufus Carter. And he slept. He had a little room out in the back, and that was where he lived. And then he'd have this juke, juke joint on the weekends. Dirt floor, beer served out of big wash tubs full of ice. And, uh, man, they would come from miles around, fill that place up in a heartbeat. So we'd go out there to Rufus Carter's place on Friday and Saturday night and play and get, you know, we'd take the door. They'd pay a buck. Uh, maybe we'd get 50 bucks total. But it was just just wonderful. And he had some good good barbecue or chicken or something? Yeah, you're good. always something to eat, yeah. He, he had chickens going. I think I had my first barbecue, uh, pork barbecue sandwich out of Rufus Carter's. Delicious. So, John, we're at the end of April right now, and I believe you were supposed to be on tour with Lyle Lovett right about now. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, we just spoke the other day about it, as a matter of fact. And, you know, we we love going out together, and we have so much fun, and it's something we've done since 1989 and never planned a second of it, uh, which is probably why we love it so much. It's just it's not like work. It's just going out and goofing off for a month. We, we giggle about, you know, don't tell the wives, you know. They think we're at work. <laughs> so, so John, I'm trying to picture, you know, Lyle Lovett and John Hyatt sitting down at a restaurant together somewhere. <laughs> what does that look like? Where do you all like to go? It's so funny because Lyle goes out to eat on the road and I am the worst. Peanut butter sandwich on the bus. And it's because I get so focused on what I'm doing that the idea of going into a restaurant and having to look at a menu is just, I might, you know, tell me to go to the dentist and have a root canal. <laughs> and I probably have a similar reaction. I just, I get so focused on the two hours that I, I can't, everything else just distracts me. But occasionally on a day off, I'll have something good to eat. But Lyle, Lyle is the cuisine of the town, man. He finds the best place, you know, that has the most, you know, and he mentions it on stage and always gets a rave review, you know, the audience, yeah, you ate at that, our favorite place, you know. And you'd think I'd pick up on it, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you have, John? A little peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> you know? uh, so, John, uh, you have had your songs covered by so many legendary artists. I mean, Bob Dylan, Eric Clapton, B.B. King, Bonnie Raitt, Jimmy Buffett. It just goes on and on and on. What is that like for you? And I'm also wondering if there's a, is there one kind of surprising cover that really stands out? Man, there's been more than one. Uh, Buddy Guy doing Feels Like Rain just about killed me. Uh, I loved it. Just loved us. He's one of my heroes. And, uh, you know, the Buddy Guy Junior Wells records I listened to when I was a kid. Uh, oh, man, the surprises. Uh, you know, Emily Lou Harris doing a song was like, you know, that sings like an angel. Woman is cutting a song of mine. You know, that's how That's how they all, they almost always feel at least, gee, you, wanted, you like that song? <laughs> 
you know, he liked it enough to record it. You know, what a what an honor. What do you think they're responding to? You know, I I, I can't put my finger on it other than uh, people and uh, lives and and the secret life beneath that we try to name and can't. Uh, you know, the the secret life of folks. Yeah, keeping it simple. Yes, I love simplicity. I'm not always the best at it, but I remember uh, I wrote a, <laughs> it was a guy at Capitol right before they dropped me in 2000, and uh, he said, he said, you write too many words if you could just boil it down. And I, you know, he's right, of course. So I wrote, in response, I wrote a song. It was called, What Do We Do Now? And the chorus is, what do we do now? 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 <laughs> I kind of wrote it thinking of this guy. So tell me what it's been like having a very talented daughter, Lily, Lily Hyatt, who is making her own way in the music business. Yeah. Oh, you know, thrilling, exciting. And, you know, my kid, all three of our kids are just so amazing. And, uh, and one of them happens to be an amazing uh, singer-songwriter, uh, which blows my mind. And she was secretive about it. Hey, talk about having your secret life. And she was much like that. She spent her time in her room. I gave her a guitar, I think, when she was 12, because um, she seemed interested. And uh, we didn't hear from her again until she was 16, and she sang at, at the uh, uh, her high school talent show. She got up and sang... Wild Horses and uh, Angel from Montgomery. Mm. And we, we, I mean, you, you could, couldn't pick our jaws up off the floor. It was like, where, what? This is a, <laughs> she, that's what she's been doing <laughs> up in her room. You know? So, yeah, it was pretty, quite a revelation. And you and Lily both seem to write songs that are, that are very personal at times. And she wrote a song about you called Imposter on her album, yes. Trinity Lane. Yes. It's, which is a really powerful song. Tell me, when was the first time you heard that? And what what, it, what kind of impression did it make on you? She told me about it when she, after she'd recorded it. So I heard her rough. And it came out of a conversation. You know, she, she was a barista at the, this little coffee shop. Uh, on and off, they had a great relationship where they'd let her go out on the road and then come back and pick it up when she needed the dough. And I was in her coffee shop and... We were talking, and I was 62 at the time, so it was five years ago, because I remember telling her, you know, as we were talking about authenticity and what is that, and sometimes we don't feel, we neither feel authentic nor even real, you know. Uh, it's like vapor <laughs> or wisps of something. And I said, you know, I felt like an imposter until I was about 62. It took me till I was about 62 to stop feeling like I was faking it. Like people were going to, you know, pull me aside from the stage and go, you know what? It's, you know, we're, you know, it's not. We're on to you. Yeah, we're on to you. And God, find another line of work. <laughs> and so, yeah, the first time I heard it, I, I, I think I cried. I know I cried. I did cry. He said, I feel like an imposter. Took me to. Well, it's a beautiful song. Are y'all talking about other collaborations, working together? You know, anything could happen. We, we've always threatened to write some songs together, and we're home a lot now. So, uh, although we've been we've been quarantined from our kids, they they took they took responsibility right away. Look, you guys are in the age group. Most, uh, you know, you're up there, and we don't want to get you sick. And so they're just starting to visit. Uh, you know, six feet apart. Uh, and that's nice. It's nice to see him. But, you know, we FaceTime. But we we miss him. We miss spending time with him. You know, you, you wrote a beautiful song called Have a Little Faith in Me that just seems very appropriate right now. And it, it's been covered by everyone. It was covered by Mandy Moore. It's covered by Dolly Parton, many others. Joe Cocker. Joe Cocker. <laughs> I'm wondering, do you remember the day that you wrote that song i do i was in uh, early sobriety 
I think it was 86, 87, probably 87. I, I probably had about a year. And I was trying to learn how to write without liquor and drugs. I'd never done it. <laughs> I hadn't since I was 11 without the aid of, uh, of, one, of, the, one, of one or both of those um, things. So I was writing songs and I had a little keyboard set up. And I'm not a good keyboard player at all, but I like the sound of piano. So I would banging out that little intro, those little three note clusters. And uh, I wrote that song in 20 minutes. It just showed up. Uh, I think I was crying uh, at some point after it came out. And it was as much uh, uh, somebody, uh, you know, telling me to have a little faith as the singer was telling the listener to have a little faith. I didn't have much. <laughs> I was trying to scrounge some up. <laughs> and when your back's against the wall, just turn around and you, you will see. I will catch you, I will catch you fall, baby. Just have a little faith. There, you know, there are a lot of people out there that could use some right now. So that's, absolutely, that's, uh, might be a, a nice one to bring back. You know, the Today Show uh, did a little photo montage of uh, first responders and babies seeing their grandparents through glass, and it was a beautiful thing. They really aired it uh, a couple weeks ago, and my manager sent me the thing, and I, I didn't know that they'd even done it. I mean, I was blubbering by the end of it, you know. I just got one more question, John, and that is, you know, what are you what are you looking forward to the most when we get on the other side of this? Oh, performing, going out and playing and well, hugging my kids for God's sake. You know, we 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 hug people, you know. And I miss that I think more than anything just having the you know, they're kids of 42, 36 and 31, but yeah, there are kids and just to be able to hug them and have them for dinner. Uh, that would be my first uh, thing, and the second one would be to, to play music with with some people, you know, listening <laughs> in close proximity, <laughs> six feet or more. <laughs> However, it's going to work. I don't know, but it's it's coming. It'll come, you know. It's it's going to come back. Well, until that day, it's been great to have you on, John Hyatt. Thank you, Sid. Thanks for being on Biscuits and Jam. Yeah, real pleasure. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to my conversation with John Hyatt. His latest album, The Eclipse Sessions, is available wherever you get music and from johnhyatt.com. Southern Living is based in Birmingham, Alabama, and this podcast was produced and edited in Nashville, Tennessee. If you like what you hear, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or telling your friends about the program. You can find us online at southernliving.com and subscribe to our print publication by searching for Southern Living at www.magazine.store. Biscuits and Jam is produced by Heather Morgan Schott, Chrissy Tiglius, and me, Sid Evans, for Southern Living. Thanks also to Ann Kane, Jim Hankey, Eliza Lambert, and Rachel King at Pod People. I'll see you back here next week for more Biscuits and Jam. <laughs>